Hey, Alex from All Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hints and tips of dentistry. If you're new here, take a look around. we got a whole bunch of stuff to, that talks about dentistry. And what we're going to be talking about today is when your canal, if you're doing a root canal, uh, it doesn't stop bleeding. Now, there's a few reasons why it won't stop bleeding, and I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. In this case, we're able to stop it, uh, but there's a reason why. So a couple of admin points. I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, I'm trying this vertical version of um, my videos because the new iPhone adapter that I have for my microscope works in the vertical format. So I was watching, I watched a couple of other videos in, in ver vertical. It's actually easier to hold my phone. And the other thing is take a look at some of these shorts I've been putting up and they're to do with, we've got Dexter in the house. I, I borrowed Dexter from, a, from another colleague of mine and we're going to take some x-rays and some of the one of the biggest bottlenecks I've noticed with new dentists during root canals is taking x-rays. So take a look at the x-rays, the videos about x-rays, see if they help and any comments you can, uh, any comments or questions you have are always greatly appreciated. Let's jump into it. Okay, so this is Mina's case and it's tooth number 17. And she, look at I clipped this off when I didn't even recognize it. So don't do that. You, when, you're, when, when you take your radiographs, you want it like this six. You want the whole, you know, at least a couple millimeters above the palatal root or whatever root that's the longest and beyond the portion of the lesion. So don't do this. Anyways, it's tooth number 17. That's the issue. And I should have retaken this, but I didn't notice it at the time. So we're missing potentially the palatal root. But tooth number 17 presented, she presented with pain to, to, to cold and hot aching pain. So she just had these restorations. Actually, the 1.6 and the 1.7 were redone recently. Uh, and the 1.7 was really bothering her. So after our endodontic diagnosis, we had tooth number 1.7, uh, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis with symptomatic apical peritonitis. And at that time, we elected to do a root canal treatment. So um, let's get started. So what happened was we I went to go and place my aura seal. So I placed a rubber dam, put the oral seal on it, boom. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I put the wrong tip on the aura seal. So the tip was too small and something had to give my big muscles when I was, in. anyways, <laughs> hopefully you had a little laugh. So after that little bit of uh, situation, I forgot to start hit on my, I start, start, start the start button on my iPhone video. So we're into the access already. Now let me just orient you to kind of what you're looking at. We've got, uh, we'll get into focus here. There we go. So we've got tooth number one seven. This is the buckle. This is the palatal. This is the mesial, and this is the distal. And you can see how I wouldn't. This is not a great example of an access. I was really opening it up to look for more canals, uh, but it turns out there's only two. And if we re look, take another look at the ape, at the radiograph, we have a fairly conical root. So that kind of is like, oh well, maybe there's a couple canals. You can see maybe a canal there, probably maybe a canal there. Uh, but I'm not going to put my money on it because I'm still always looking for like a baby, baby first molar, if you may. Still kind of the same. We're looking for four canals. Um, but in this case, what we did was I extended my axis just a little bit more to the mesial buckle to see if there's, you know, a pulp horn, which then I might, which might lead down the side of the tooth to a, uh, to the mesial buckle one and MB2. And then the distal, just a little bit of extension uh, distally as well. But at the meantime, so what happens is what my experience has been is that this actually bifurcates about two to three millimeters below what you can see. That's really been my experience. And the problem is, is that if you don't have great magnification, like 4.0 oh, 4 or greater loops, it's really hard to find these. Uh, so that's one of the things that's going to be in the back of my mind is, you know, yeah, okay, great. I got two canals, but where are the other ones? So you can see here we've got a buccal canal and we've got a palatal canal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the standard thing I normally do is just open the coronal two thirds with my wave and go primary. Now, watch what happens here is for some reason, I put the stopper at a certain point and I wasn't focusing on doing the coronal two thirds. The file just dropped and I actually went beyond where I normally go, which is the first 17 millimeters of the file. And then I'll do my working length. So what I was doing was just removing the pulp tissue. And, you know, one of the things I can give you advice on, especially if you're doing new, brand new at doing dentistry and root canals, um, take a look at one of the videos, especially by Ali Nassay talking about a PSA uh, and anesthesia for maxillary teeth. 
And once you get into these teeth, what I'd recommend is getting the palatal pulp tissue out as fast as possible if you can, because usually my experience has been um, if you're taking your, you know, if you're brand new, it's going to take some time to do these root canals. The palatal canal starts to kind of, patient starts to feel it after a while. Um, so get all that pulp tissue out of there as quick as possible when you start your root canal. And that way you don't have to worry about that pulpal, at least the pulpal tissue. Now the periapical tissue, I can't help you in that if you're taking your time. So what's happened, what's happening at this point? Turn it off before you go and wipe it. So. What's happening at this moment is that I'm actually, I over-instrumented by probably a millimeter when I initially went in there. So I realized that at this moment. So what I'm going to do is, and that's the reason why one of these canals wouldn't stop bleeding. So what happened, what I did was I know that this is already going to length and I'm not going to use a 10 file. I'm just using straight on the file, on straight rotary file, reciprocating file. So I'm going to place my, my, um, eight teeth air packs right on the file and I'm going to stop it and I'm actually going to take my measurement there. So I normally don't do that. In this case, the canal was pretty wide open and it dropped right down. So I feel pretty confident after like 5,000 of these teeth that we're good to go with that. Um, I do that the same in the palatal canal. I'm going to get to my working length. Uh, with my eight teeth air packs, and then we take my length and that's it. But in the meantime, what's happened is that the apical millimeter of this file has gone too far. And with a tooth that's already symptomatic, with symptomatic apical periodontitis, there's inflammation down there. Patients, it's, you know, it's pain and percussion. Sometimes those PDLs don't want to stop bleeding. And that's why this technique I'm going to show you actually is effective, I think, in these cases. Um, but you got to make sure that the bleeding is not from pul excess pulpal tissue remnants in the isthmus, remnants in anywhere. And you would never know if it's in the isthmus. So you got to make sure that you open the apical portion of the canal up significant. Because oftentimes, my experience has been in palatal canals and distal canals. Palatal canals are actually teeth like this. And mandibular distal canals will hemorrhage, especially if they're those pulps are hyperemic, if you may you want to use that word. There's hemorrhaging all over the place until you get rid of all that pulpal tissue. Uh, I have another case. I'm not going to put it in this, but there's another case where you see it's the patient, uh, the tooth has been sensitive to cold since the restoration for the last two years. And once we pop it in that tooth, I mean, it just started hemorrhaging like crazy. Uh, but it stops once you get rid of the, actually, I will, I'll see, if I remember to do it at the end of the video, I'll put it in there. But once you remove all the pulpal tissue, effectively from the apical third, boom, bleeding stops. You can see what's going on. It's amazing. Uh, I was just talking with one of our new dentists who we was just mentoring uh, this morning, actually talking about it. And I just showed her like, look, if you get rid of all the pulpal tissue, just like I did here, 99% of the time, you're good to go. But in this case, look at that, that little block, that little bleed out of the buccal canal. I know now that if I can't get that stopped in the next like five minutes, it's just going to not stop. So what I've been doing, so there's a couple techniques. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I ap debride the apical portion, remove all the pulpal tissue with my medium, so my 3506. So you can still, it's still bleeding. So to me, I still don't know if it's excess pulpal tissue at the apical third. I'm hoping it is because if I debride the canal, look at that, I just aspirated. If you've never done that, I've rare, I have don't do this very often because I don't like to get a lot of bleeds from the chamber, but uh, from the from the canal. I'm aspirating my hemorrhage, aspirating my uh, my irrigant with my hemorrhage in there. So what I'm going to do is, you can see it's just continuing to bleed. And I'm sure you're familiar with cases like this, but you have to make sure that, you know, that the three questions, the three possibles, and I've thought about this, the three possibilities is that you've perforated. I don't think I have in this case. Two, um, the second one is that there's, ex like I talked about, there's excess pulpal tissue either at the apical portion of that canal or in the isthmus that's still connected to the uh, the PDL and getting blood supply through accessory lateral canals. Uh, or it's you've over-instrumented. And in this case, after how I find out this is over-instrumented, I'm going to open this up to a 3506 and then... See if I can get there. We go. We're back in, so you can see all that hemorrhage is still hemorrhaging. I'm opening this up, and what I'm doing here is actually I learned this when I got my own root canal. 
is just scrub the walls. Scrub the walls to break down any of that vital tissue. That's what I'm doing there. And I'll do that in all canals to break down the biofilm. And there's not so much a biofilm in this situation, but there's vital tissue. We want to break that down. So I'm trying to, and what this is doing is trying to break up, again, vital tissue, but also trying to stop that bleed in the, pal in the buccal canal. So I'm going to do that. And if the hemorrhage doesn't stop, then, well, I got to do something else. So another, so now I'm confident that it's not excess tissue, uh, sorry, yeah, not excess pulpal tissue in that canal. I feel that it's debrided well enough. And I, you know, you could argue that sodium epichloride has not been in that canal long enough to stop the bleed. Uh, but my experience has been like, if I haven't been able to get it stopped after this amount, um, it's going to be pretty tough. And it looks like it's stopped, but it's just one of those like slow weeping bleeds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scout around for to see if, oh, so before I do that, I only just did this a day ago, i forgotten. Um, because I feel like I've over-instrumented by a millimeter, uh, I'm going to use a larger file. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to reconfirm my working length using a larger file. This is a 2507. Um, so I'm going to, and you can do that with your nickel titanium files. They replicate working lengths just as well as any other stainless steel file. So I'm going to use that rather than using a 15. I want to make sure that I'm right on the money. And the reason why I want to make sure I'm on the money, if I believe that I've over instrumented, there's two problems here. One, I've lost obviously working length. So I'm worried about, because when you have a constriction, you know, you've got a beautiful little, nature made constriction. So now what's happened is I we've opened it up and my irrigant can go into the apical tissues, which I don't want to happen. So I want to make sure that I am more, more precise than ever with my working length on my, with my irrigating syringe. So that's the reason why I'm using just this file. Instead of going in the drawer and get another 25, 25 tip file, like a red file, red nickel, um, stainless steel file or a 30 stainless steel file. I'll just use what we got. Um, in our hands. So we're going to get our working length precise in both canals. And then what we're going to do is we're going to re-irrigate and let's just check to see if that hemorrhage has stopped. Now, sodium epichloride has been in the apical portion for what, almost 10 minutes now maybe? So I'm going to give it more time to work, the sodium epichloride. And what I'm going to do here is, remember I talked about I'll just let this play. Uh, I talked about bifurcation of this buccal canal routinely. It routinely happens where one to two millimeters below that orifice, that buccal canal bifurcates into two canals, which is great. The problem is, is that if you don't use high magnification, it's hard to, hard to see it. So here what we can do is we're going to double check this a few times in the next part of the procedure but I'm using a bent file with my, and my rubber stop, the, the unidirectional indicator is curved to, is directed towards a curve. And I'm using the tip of that file to feel around to see if I can get into another orifice. That's all I'm doing here. Because perhaps that orifice is below where I can see. So we'll use our other method of figuring things out is our tactile sense. And it, honestly, you know, you hear about tactile sense. It takes a very long time to create that, um, like a very, very long time. I'm not saying I'm an expert at all, but it's taken me many, many, many years of practice and many years of extract, just extracted teeth here and there. Like, oh, that's what that feels like. Oh, that's what that feels like. So you can see here, I'm not getting, so again, whoops. So here you can see I've got a curve on that, on that file. I'm going to insert the the file into the canal and I'm going to walk it up and down turning this like a little beacon like at an airport those little lights that go around and around and around anyway so the bleeding has not I haven't figured out anything I can't figure it out and the bleeding as you can tell has not stopped so it's time to we'll rinse that out again and that's a pretty red bleed so I'm like well probably it's PDL based uh, I'm not happy about that, but um, what I'm going to do is instead of, I mean, the canal is clean. 
we're working with our sodium hypochlorite to make sure, like I've got more ear aspirin. I'm happy with debridement. We're gonna make sure that we get 20 minutes of full strength sodium hypochlorite in this case as a, at a, as a minimum to break down that vital tissue. So let's see what I do next. Just put it the cat out of the bag. All right, so we're gonna dry the, we'll dry the case. There we go. So that obviously doesn't work. So I'm sure you tried that using paper points. That doesn't do the damn thing. So what I'm going to do here is I've actually started doing this once in a while. And it just happened by fluke that I noticed that when I had cases like this and I was like, I don't know what to do. So I just placed some BC sealer. Or what happened was, actually, you know how I learned this? I just remembered it. Just as I was about to place a gutta percha point a few times, I'd see C, or I wouldn't even see seepage. It would like, I placed my gutter percha point with sealer down and I'm like, oh, why is it bleeding? It hadn't, it's like a slow, slow bleed and all of a sudden there'd be blood coming up. I'm like, okay, well that's not good. So what I'll do is I'll take the, I took a radiograph and then I seared off. So say for example, I place a gutter percha here, a gutter percha here with sealer, take my x-ray, sear the pellet canal off, pull this gutter percha out and then I'd start rinsing it out with sodium hypochlorite. And I'm like, oh, the bleed has stopped. That's strange. So what I've learned is that this um, BC sealer, these tricalcium silicates, actually seem to have some sort of anticoagulant or uh, coagulant mechanism, astringent, astringent properties. How about that? So, is this by the book? Absolutely not. Well, this I don't recommend doing this if you not not confirm that it's a PDL hemorrhage. And obviously, we're putting some of that. BC sealer into the apical tissues. Now you can argue left, right, and center that this is wrong. I don't disagree, but I can tell you that in the middle of trying to get this case completed, um, and the patient definitely does not want to come back. And it's a pretty simple case. We have two canals. Um, this works actually fairly well. So what I'm going to do now is that we've got this bioceramic and hemorrhage product mess. We're going to irrigate this just like regular. We're going to irrigate all that out. You can see, actually, what's really helpful about putting the BC sealer in is that you can try to see, it lightens up the orifice so I can actually see more of if there's another, if there's a bifurcation, it helps. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a lot of time irrigating this case out. Then what we're going to do is we're going to, to continue irrigate, part of the irrigation protocol, I'm going to use just manual dynamic activation just with a gutta percha point. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, to continue the 20 minutes of Sodium hypochlorite in the canals. I'm going to actually try my points in with uh, got a little bit of just a little bit of sodium hypochlorite in the canals just to extend that contact time. Take our radiograph, do a, a cone check, and then we'll finish the case. So if you want to learn the secret, that was it. Just use a little bit of BC sealer. You can place it on a paper point. You place it in the canal. The syringe, it doesn't really matter. You have to be cautious that um, you are going to be probably putting some into the surrounding periapical tissues, which you could argue is totally wrong. There, another way you can do it is using Cutrol. It's spelled C-U-T-R-O-L. Um, I've never used it actually because I don't normally have a problem like this, but when this happens, it does happen. Now, the next question you're going to say is, you know, you're extruding B sealer into the apical tissues. I mean, I'm not a fan of it, but every Facebook endodontist, Instagram endodontist has puff, sealer puffs all over the place, whether it's resin, zinc oxide eugenol and now BC sealer. So I think at this point of the game, we know that it's not gonna make that much of an effect of your outcome. So what we're gonna do is while I'm talking here, we're gonna irrigate it out. You can see there's lots of irrigant. If there's one thing, I'm using a 10 mil syringe. Uh, there's lots of irrigation, that's a key. Lots and lots and lots. And you can see it's coming out clean. Um, we're making sure we get rid of that BC sealer. Is it critical? Not really, because it's going to be part of the process anyways. But I want to make sure I get all if get rid of all of everything, debris, anything, pulp tissue. If there's any corona, if there's any tissue left. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're just going to take our working length radiograph. We'll place our little rubber carrots in our tooth, and then let's go ahead and take a look at our radiograph. So. Here's our radiograph here. Let me just close this off for one sec. That's not what I wanted. All right. So here's our radiograph here. You can see this can this this actually fell out a bit, but I have remember I used the Wave 1 Gold primary for my working length. 
I'm super, I'm really confident with that working length. So this is just, um, I'm just showing that uh, when I take it, I always do a cone shot. I've, when I don't do cone shots, I'm, I have to redo the whole case. So I take a cone shot. You can see I'm at length here. I'm not happy with this length, but I'm not worried about it because when I went back in the case, the cone had fallen out, so it had moved a bit. You can see that little bit of BC sealer up here that I placed down here. Uh, now I called the patient a day later. It was tender to, to percussion and likely the over instrumentation was part of that. And you can see this is going to be tender as well. So let's go ahead and finish operating the case. If you made it to this point, I'm super grateful. <laughs> you made it. You made it. So yeah, see there right there. You can even see it. So the point had slowly made its way out. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a final rinse. More rinsing, more rinsing, more rinsing, more rinsing, more rinsing. That's the name of the game. It's not about what you put in. It's about what you take out uh, in root canals. And then we're going to dry. And look at that. Isn't that a beautiful thing when those paper points come out? We'll place it down to length. They come out white and not red. Beautiful. It's amazing. And the other thing that, you know, normally I find is that if I've, um, if there still is pulpal tissue in there, sometimes you'll still see remnants along the side of the gutter of the point. So take a look for that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually using this time to evaluate to make sure what you saw me do right there is just, this is a length check. So I place my gutter percha point in. I take it from my reference point. Let's see if I can see it. You can't see it. I take my reference point, bite it down, and I just tap it on the tooth just to see. So this is 18. It's not that exact, but it gives me a ballpark. 18 and 20. Should be a 22 on here. Um, and I'm just looking to give me a ballpark idea of if we're out or if the canal is dry or whatnot. So that's what I'm doing there. So I'll make sure we're dry. And then what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in. Now you can see how the BC sealer is just a little bit around there. And what that helps me do is to light up the case to see if I'm, if there's any bifidity. So if there's any, I'm still looking again to make sure there's, I didn't miss a canal because that's the last thing a patient wants is to have to come back. Okay, so you can see here, we've zoomed right in. I'm looking here. I've felt around here with a file, can't feel anything. I've looked here, can't feel anything. We're just making sure that there's no extra canal looking there. You can see where I've gone a little bit more mesial just to see if there is another canal, but got nothing and a little bit distal here, got nothing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna place our BC sealer and let's finish the case. So we'll place our BC sealer. I'm now using just an acid etch tip. It's just easier to find. They're always in the drawer and they save more BC sealer so you don't have to waste so much in those big tips that I've been using for the last like half a decade. So we place a little bit of BC sealer, BC sealer in the canals, in the orifice, and then we're going to just place our rubber carrots in our tooth, place it down to length. We'll pump it a few times. And then I'm gonna use my eight teeth fast pack to sear it off. And what I'm doing here is I'm searing, I'm going right to the bottom, searing right towards tooth structure and boom, that's it. And then we're good. Still got, got a percha in the canals, didn't pull it out. And then we're just gonna do a little bit of a burnishing pack on the little bit of pressure on the top. And then we're gonna take my air water syringe and uh, blow lots of air and water in that tooth together just to rinse everything out and then that's it so I'll show you what it looks like at the end there's a palatal canal and whoop there's a palatal canal and then there's our buccal canal and that's it and so let's take a look at the final radiograph you can see here that we have there's that sealer puff from before we added a little bit uh, there's little bit of a puff there if not right to the PDL uh, with some sealer you can see here I'm not happy with this but this is kind of where I troughed to look for another mesial canal uh, I would have preferred to have my access obviously a little bit more straighter but the thing is is that I may have missed a canal so I'd rather have this kind of tooth is gonna get crowned anyway so let's do the proper endodontics and then uh, then we don't have to have any problems so anyways Hopefully that helps. I really appreciate making it to the end of that video, of this video. You know, put your comments below. I really appreciate your time. 
and I'm grateful you're here. Anyways, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.